Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're excited to do another uh, interview with the Journal of Immunotherapy and Precision Oncology. And uh, today we've got Dr. Jeffrey Weber with us today, who is a medical oncologist and deputy director of the Lauren Isaac Perlmutter Cancer Center in New York. And he's the co-director of the New York University Melanoma Spore. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Weber. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about uh, immunotherapy-induced colitis and specifically uh, the approach to diagnosis. Uh, Dr. Weber has an interest in uh, melanoma and immunotherapy as well, and he's an expert in this field, so we're excited to pick his brain. And we actually put a poll out on our um, Twitter page um, asking our audience, you know, for immunotherapy-induced colitis, which of the following would be routinely used to make the diagnosis? And our options included a stool sample for infection, uh, performing a CT abdomen pelvis, uh, doing a colonoscopy or all of the above. And more than half of respondents actually chose doing all three. And we're uh, excited to have Dr. Weber with us today to tell us you know, what he thinks about immunotherapy induced colitis and the approach to diagnosis and what he thinks about these results. Sure. Well, the first thing you need to think about is uh, the question might be posed a little bit differently. And you could say for grade three diarrhea and or colitis, which of the following would you routinely use to make the diagnosis? Um, I would say, it, assuming that that is the case, that's a fairly staggering cost of care when half of the patients are getting colonoscopy, CT, the abdomen and pelvis and stool samples for infection. I think it should be flipped the other way. I think every patient with, with diarrhea on immunotherapy, and remember grade three means more than six diarrheas a day above and beyond baseline, right? So if you have someone who normally has one diarrhea a day, you know, that in and of itself is not toxicity. If that's their baseline, it has to be at least seven or more. That's grade three. And that's when it becomes important. So in my experience, and again, when I say my experience, I've been doing this since 2001. That was my first case of colitis. Okay, so I've been doing this for a while and I've treated a few thousand total patients. Exactly. I would say in that experience, relatively few patients need to have a colonoscopy. So first let's, let's talk about colonoscopy. I think colonoscopy or in the early days was done on every patient with diarrhea and colitis induced by immunotherapy. Today, I think we have so much experience managing the condition that it's only the patients with recurring grade two toxicity, meaning three to six diarrheas in a day, where you're really not sure how much of a steroid dose to give. Do you give them big time steroids? Do you give them IV steroids? You do a colonoscopy and if they have serious ulceration or findings above and beyond maybe the three diarrheas a day with no symptoms other than that, that's when you give them big time steroids, two mg per kilogram per day, you give them a 30 day taper and you may start out with giving IV methylprednisolone. Or if someone's been on steroids, they're steroid refractory, they've been at two mg per kilogram, you're not sure what to do. do you, could there be another cause? How bad is it? That's when you do a colonoscopy, <coughs> excuse me. And that's when it may absolutely convince you if you see ulceration and diffuse erythema and bleeding points, yeah, you're going to add, micro, you know, you're going to give them a dose of infliximab. You might add mycophenolic acid. That's when it reaches an important decision point. So I don't know about other institutions, but at the places I've been in the past, uh, getting an urgent colonoscopy is not an easy task for clear cut reasons. It's, it's a procedure. You can't just snap your fingers and whistle up a colonoscopy in the emergency department in most cases. Sure. So it's something that should be done in the right situation, it would not be 50% of cases, it would not be 25% of cases, it might be five or 10%. But that's when I would do a colonoscopy. CT, the abdomen and pelvis, I think is, is a good test so that if you see stranding of the mess in the mesentery, I think you have a diagnosis of colitis. The problem is that's usually only done in the ED. And at least in our ED, they, they have a CAT scanner that's like 20 feet away from the, 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 the main ED bays. So it's, you know, you just wheel them over in one minute, they're in the CAT scanner. Yeah, it's easy to get. Would I routinely in an outpatient get a CAT scan of the abdomen if I think I know the diagnosis is colitis? No, I, I don't see the re rationale. It's an expensive procedure. It requires contrast. Uh, I think, again, you do it if you're not sure what the diagnosis is. 
I, I think that in this scenario, the important stuff is flipped in importance. I think you have to check stool for O and P, the usual infections, and C. diff. Now, because somebody has C. diff doesn't mean they have immunotherapy. It doesn't mean they don't have immunotherapy-induced colitis. They, they could certainly coexist. It just means you need to treat the C. diff as well as the immune-related colitis. In a patient on ipinevo, pembro, tezolizumab, nevo, whatever the, the PD-1 or, or CTLA-4 PD-1 combo is, I, I think patients with diarrhea at grade three, meaning seven or more in a day in 24 hours, with symptoms, abdominal pain, et cetera, et cetera, I think those patients need to have the presumptive diagnosis of colitis induced by immune checkpoint inhibition until proven otherwise. Um, it's a little hard to prove otherwise. Uh, obviously, if you go back and get a history from the patient and they admit to you that, oh, by the way, I really uh, had a, a history of ulcerative colitis seven years ago and I'm off treatment, but I just neglected to mention it to you <laughs> because I <laughs> thought if I did, I wouldn't be able to go on immunotherapy. Okay, I've been there, done that. Uh, that's perhaps more of an exacerbation of an existing ulcerative colitis condition. But the vast majority of cases of diarrhea in a patient on immune checkpoint inhibition proximate in time to the administration of the drug is due to the drug mm -hmm. and you need to treat it with steroids. I mean, the controversies that would arise um, are not as much diagnostic as management related, meaning how much steroid for how long. Um, and if someone has grade three colitis or diarrhea, could you have it resolve on steroids and then retreat them? The answer to the last question is, depending on the scenario, absolutely. I've done that both on and off protocol. But I, I, I don't think that you need to colonoscope every patient with grade, even grade two or three diarrhea and or colitis. I think we would agree someone who's sick enough to be admitted to the hospital with bloody diarrhea uh, probably merits a colonoscopy to make sure you have the right diagnosis. But that's pretty rare. Uh, I can count on one hand the number of patients that I've had to admit to the hospital with diarrhea and colitis in the last couple of years. I think the key is not in this uh, survey. I think the key is good communication between the patient and the care team, vigilance by the care team, and jumping on diarrhea and symptoms of colitis early on and getting the patients on steroids at the right dose, not 40 milligrams of prednisone a day in an 80 kilogram guy, mm -hmm. but at least one mg per kilogram, if not more, depending on the intensity of the diarrhea or the colitis symptoms, and knowing when to move quickly to infliximab. You know, if you look at the ASCO guidelines, I think they say 72 to 96 hours. If you're not seeing proper resolution, you move to infliximab. I would say 48 to 72 hours max in my personal experience. If you're not seeing good resolution of symptoms, that's when you move to five mg per kilogram of infliximab. And your GI colleagues will say, well, maybe it should be 10 mg per kilogram if it's severe diarrhea and colitis. Or if you give a dose of infliximab two weeks later and things aren't getting better, that's maybe when you should move to 10 milligrams mm -hmm. per kilogram. So those are important issues. And again, I, I think it, with the experience we have, the vast majority of episodes of colitis are managed without colonoscopy. And unless they're in the ED, they're managed without a CAT scan of the abdomen and pelvis. Got it. So it sounds like good clinical judgment and communication. Uh, it sounds like you routinely use just uh, infectious studies for the stool, making sure you don't have to treat them concomitantly for an infection. Yeah, and then, you know, calprotectin in the stool is, is in the ASCO guidelines. I think that's mm -hmm. another uh, inflammatory uh, test that can be useful. Um, I mean, I suppose, you know, in an era when you're giving checkpoint inhibition with chemotherapy to many non-melanoma histologies, like bladder, or head and neck, or breast, or MSI high colon, non-small cell lung cancer, I suppose, um, uh, chemotherapy induced diarrhea is an issue. And that's where the calprotectin, uh, and the, the CAT scan will come in handy, by the way. Got it. Got it. Well, 
Thank you so much, Dr. Weber. It was great having you, great hearing from you and hearing from your expertise. And thank you for taking the time to go through these responses too in the poll. I think they were very interesting to see that difference in distribution between our respondents and how you would approach it. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. All right, great. Appreciate having you. Thanks for having me. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.